Okay, well, why don't we get moving here? Um, one, we want to start by saying welcome and thank you for joining us. We're Region Network and we're honored to be uh, presenting here today. Um, for those of you not aware, um, personally, I have a, a really a neat and long history with the Kavira Coalition in particular um, as a former MC and uh, marketing partner uh, for Kavira, and I always wanted to be part of a presentation and not just MC. So I'm uh, really excited to be here today with my colleagues uh, here at Regen Network. Um, just to make sure you're in the right place, uh, you are here to learn about the Carbon Plus Grasslands credits for regenerative ranch management. So uh, if you're in the wrong place, this is your opportunity to go, uh, or if you're already excited to stay. So a um, couple uh, housekeeping things before we move into our slides. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we're going to be uh, recording this, uh, so just please be aware of that. Uh, we're going to have a couple of polls for you. Um, everyone is uh, muted, obviously, at the moment. Um, sorry for my dryer. Really a long one. Um, and we're going to be uh, sharing this uh, presentation with all the attendees after the fact. And a, and a couple of other pieces of context, you know, we did uh, do uh, get an idea of who's here in the room. And in, you'll see the slides um, and the presentation uh, is based on some assumption that either you are interested or um, interacting with groups who are interested in being um, financially supported for their ecological stewardship. So some of these uh, questions uh, or uh, comments may not apply directly to you, but we assume you're here because you're interested in either sharing that with your networks, uh, your clients, your partners and colleagues, or you're a landowner and you're trying to figure out how to be rewarded for your ecological stewardship. So bear with us. Um, please feel free on just a, a technical level to use the chat function. If you have any questions or comments you wanna to make to the panelists, uh, we also have the Q&A, um, if you want to be a little bit more formal about getting your question posed and shared and answered. Uh, we are going to do our best um, to collect and organize all the questions uh, toward the and answer them toward the end of the presentation. But obviously, if anything comes up on a technical level or you just need a, a quick a point of reference or information, we'll do our best uh, to answer those as it comes along. So with all that said, uh, Sarah, would you mind moving to the next slide? So just re, uh, re, uh, sharing who are, who's here on the phone. It's uh, myself, I'm Dave Fortson, I'm the Director of Marketing. I'm also the CEO of Loacom. Super honored to be here, been with Regen Network for quite some time, um, helping uh, developing marketing communication side of things. Sarah Baxendale, she's our Director of Finance and Ron Steinhertz, director of product. So uh, thank you to my colleagues at Regen. We're scattered all over the place and uh, we live in Zoom. So this is nothing new to us, uh, but it is always nice to see our colleagues in the morning. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, start with a poll. And again, per my earlier comments, uh, this may not apply directly to all of you, but we're interested to see uh, based on your current uh, stewardship of your uh, lands that you manage or um, that you own, what uh, type of ecological co-benefits that you might see on your property currently. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, launch this poll. Should be up in front of you. If it doesn't apply to you, don't worry about answering it, that's fine. Um, and if it does, please go ahead and click on any of the answers. Um, so these are ecological uh, benefits that you might be seeing on your property. And we'll leave this up for about a minute. Um, or uh, if we get pretty close to uh, a bunch of you answering. So thank you for doing that. Okay, it looks like uh, the answers are slowing down. I will give you another 10 seconds if you wanna get your answer in. Uh, full 70% of you have voted, so that's great to see. 
All right, we're going to go ahead and end the poll and post the results so you and us can see what was shared. So here are results. Take a look and so you can get an idea of what your colleagues um, and partners here on the call are experiencing as uh, ecological co-benefits on your property or on property you manage. Pretty interesting. Excellent. Okay, we're going to go ahead and stop sharing this. This will be a nice data point for us and move on to our next slide. So, you know, we want to give you a, a little bit of insight in who we are. Um, you know, Regen Network was uh, born in many ways out of TerraGenesis Inter International, commonly referred to as TGI. They're a supply consultancy um, doing deep uh, regenerative design for making sure that the products that end up on your plate or on your uh, body. Um, you know, are developed in the most, uh, with the most integrity when it comes to ecological uh, uh, sanctity, if you will. And they, you know, a bunch of brilliant individuals um, who saw some gaps and uh, spun off this other concept called Regen Network. Regen Network was designed to support regeneratively designed ecological, uh, to support regeneratively designed ecological stewardship that recognizes the uniqueness of the people, place, and land. So this is a big deal, right? It's not a one size fits all. It was recognizing as they traveled around the world that the people, place, uh, and the land in, in and of itself were all unique, that um, ecological stewardship would look different in lots of different places, and uh, they needed to be designed accordingly. And then on a, as we got into thinking about how to do this, you know, getting back into like, how do you design a, a, a concept, a business model, and a product that really disrupts the centralized uh, carbon markets uh, that, you know, have lots of middle people in the middle. They uh, decided to move into a posture of being open source, of being decentralized uh, as, an, as an ethos, and focusing on leveraging blockchain technology and remote sensing together, as those both have uh, developed rapidly which would allow for scale, global uh, deployment and impact, really deep impact. So um, for those of you not aware, um, that's how we uh, kind of came to be. Uh, we're now a company, and I actually will refer to Sarah, how many people uh, large were, but more or less, uh, we're a in really interesting mix of um, uh, agriculturalists, of technologists, um, of scientists, uh, you know, product managers, a whole mix, a suite of individuals all rooted in um, helping design a product and a platform that regenerates the planet. Next slide, please. Can you slide over, Sarah, one slide? If it's, there it is. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> That's moving extra fast. Sorry about Sarah, this. The, the, it's <laughs> Sometimes <all good>. my <laughs> computer. <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, would you like to take it away from here? Yeah, absolutely. So, I'm Sarah Baxendale, like Dave said, um, and like he was alluding, a lot of our team are farmers ourselves. And so, the, the crux of what we do as Regen started from our perspective, working with farmers and being farmers. And we wanted to root this presentation in the reality of what's happening in our agriculture and food system today. So from the perspective of our, our land stewards, you know, adopting regenerative agriculture conservation practices is expensive. And in some cases, the price is prohibitive to changing patterns of behavior and patterns of land management. Right now in the marketplace, there are not a lot of uh, ecological outcomes uh, that can be packaged into products and sold in the marketplace that are based on regenerative agriculture or regenerative land management. And that is something that Regen Network is trying to change. Because ultimately, right now, the crisis that we face is that our topsoils are becoming increasingly scarce. We're experiencing a global uh, carbon, atmospheric carbon spike. We're having catastrophic losses of biodiversity across the entire globe and across all ecosystems. And we're seeing these increases in weather patterns that are affecting ranchers and farmers, as well as our coastlines and our communities in general. So we feel right now that 
farmers, foresters, conservationists, ranchers are not adequately incentivized for the ecological stewardship and the ecological outcomes that come from that stewardship in the current marketplace. And our goal with today's presentation is to introduce you as ranchers to the Carbon Plus Grasslands Credit, which is one way in which we're trying to incentivize changes in land management practices by incentivizing ranchers to ranch more holistically. And right now we feel like the existing get is expensive. It's very hard to manage a project on the existing markets. The process of the existing markets is very inefficient. It takes a lot of time and involves a lot of people. It involves a lot of documents. And that there's a lack of transparency into actual farm and ecological outcome data in the current carbon credit marketplace. For example, if you go on a registry and buy a credit, you know, it's only in some circumstances that you can even see what place or what person or what project was associated with that carbon credit. And we think that ecological stewardship should be financially rewarded. We also think that that should be coupled with telling the story of ranchers and farmers and their land so that we can reconnect people's understanding of ecology to financial mechanisms. Ron, you have this slide. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Um, so continuing on the thread that uh, Sarah just presented, we really try to build uh, our registry uh, that we call region registry from the ground up. Um, and that means we were working hand in hand with uh, ranchers in uh, New South Wales and Australia uh, and building the first methodology and the first credit class and uh, really informing a lot of the overall design of the registry. Um, so the benefits that we were looking uh, to address or, or the problems that we're trying to address, first of all, lower the overall costs. Uh, we've heard time and again uh, that the existing uh, carbon markets are uh, too expensive for the typical land steward out there. Um, numbers vary significantly, but could be, you know, over $100,000 for a project. It really depends also on the size but certainly not something that is um, palatable or, or, or applicable to most land stewards. The other thing is uh, reducing time to market. So uh, for instance, in New South Wales, there's, uh, or in Australia, there's a um, registry sponsored by the government called the Emission Reduction Fund. Uh, it takes literally six months to register a project. Uh, we know that your time is super important uh, and we try to respect that and really streamline the process. So you fill up a project plan and within a few days, you're ready to go. Um, it's important to us to certainly mitigate climate change and sequester carbon as much as possible. And the uh, carbon plus uh, grasslands as, as its name certainly encourages that, but we're also looking at a broad set of ecological outcomes. We'll expand on that in the, in the next few slides. But as a registry as a whole, uh, we want to support certainly carbon sequestration, but also how do we increase biodiversity, uh, water quality, uh, et cetera, similar to the poll question uh, that Dave posted early on. Um, from the buyer standpoint, and this is essentially in the registry, if you think about it, we're uh, trying to address mainly two uh, stakeholders, the buyers on the one hand and land stewards or project developers on the other. Uh, so providing buyer assurances is critical for any um, functional registry. And so transparency for all the project data, everything is available on the project page. This is certainly, uh, I think, a high bar that we don't necessarily see in other uh, registries out there, uh, enabling uh, you know, every buyer essentially to really dig into the details and understand how the monitoring was done, how the baseline uh, was measuring the carbon, et cetera. Um, trust, so we have a similar uh, process to existing registries where we have a peer review process that the methodologies and the credit classes will go through. Uh, there's a third party independent verification of the data provided by um, project developers and monitors. 
and the all the data is going to be posted on our blockchain technology, which provides a, a uh, immutable record or a digital audit trail. Um, so that's uh, that's important aspects of building trust. And then we'll showcase this in the next uh, few slides, but it's really important for us to really highlight the story here of the land uh, and the ecological impacts. Uh, and uh, to that end, we really created a project page that is focused on telling the story of the farmer or the rancher uh, and, and not just abstracting it out to a um, uh, number of CO2 equivalent. Go ahead. I think this is you, Sarah. You're on mute. <laughs> My bad. So the goal of Redun Network is to accelerate a new market that realigns economic health with ecological well-being by providing a way to track, verify, and reward regenerative agriculture and conservation at scale. So this is ultimately the goal that we set forth and the reason why we have developed the Regen Registry and the Carbon Plus Credits is to align economics and ecology effectively in a way that allows land stewards to be rewarded for their good decision making. Ron? Right, so continuing on the uh, slides before and the, you know, why would this be interesting for, for you guys uh, working in the land? So hopefully this can generate a, a much needed revenue stream. We know that uh, uh, being a farmer is, is difficult. Uh, margins are, are quite slim. Um, the other thing is how do we streamline the process? I mentioned this, the registration, but not only that, the monitoring, we're using uh, remote sensing technology that really streamlines the amount of soil samples that are needed. Uh, and makes the whole process a lot more uh, straightforward. Um, the marketing uh, is a certainly unique aspect of our registry. So we're, we're trying to really tell the story of uh, what's unique about each and every project. Uh, and we'll show that in the next few slides. Uh, that is certainly not the focus of most registries out there that are more of a um, tabular form uh, and certainly uh, does not lend itself to um, neither telling the story nor actually garnering uh, premiums on, on the market, which is certainly what we're aiming for. Um, highlighting co-benefits, uh, like I said, it's, it's sort of a, a strong focus for us to uh, include the overall social and ecological benefits that uh, the work is doing uh, beyond just uh, carbon sequestration. And then ultimately, we want to make sure that uh, the revenues are mostly kept in your pocket. Uh, the existing markets are quite uh, complicated, to put it uh, lightly. Uh, and it ended up creating this whole uh, industry of project developers and consultants. Uh, and typically, the actual uh, money left in the pocket of the land steward is quite uh, slim. So we were trying to shift and change that to, to have the majority of that go to the land steward rather than the other way around. Next slide. So this uh, are a few screenshots and the, the next slide will actually show you the live page. But on the right, you can see a glimpse of the project page. This is the actual um, project I mentioned earlier in New South Wales. Um, it is a rotational grazing operation, 1800 hectares. Uh, beautiful land and um, uh, it's a small town called Hernani, uh, which is in the um, mid plateaus, I believe it's called, in, in New England and New South Wales. But um, they have around uh, 3,000 cattle head and uh, they've done phenomenal work of increasing the soil organic carbon to four and a half percent over uh, since taking over since 2013. On the left, you can see here uh, the view that, uh, and this is not ready right now, this uh, will be down the road, but as a buyer, uh, particularly corporates that have specific uh, climate goals, whether it's uh, biodiversity, uh, you can see a bunch of biodiversity projects here, uh, or uh, carbon sequestration, they can essentially create their own portfolio and select the projects that are relevant to them and fund it uh, directly through the platform. Again, that's not something that uh, you would be able to see in other registries. Um, 
maybe we'll switch to the next slide and actually see uh, the, the live page. All right. So um, this is the live page and we'll show you also in a uh, work in progress upgraded page that is more landsword focused. But you can see here on the left, the pictures, there's also a, a video of the uh, project uh, at a glance on the right gives you a um, overview of the project. Like I mentioned, they increased the solar organic carbon to four and a half percent and the co-benefits uh, include here improvements in the ecosystem, health, and the animal welfare. If you scroll down, you can see the story of the actual uh, land steward and the project. Um, and here's a summary of the uh, project developer and land steward, who they are uh, on the right. Scrolling down, you can see a section that really explains a little bit more about how the credit class is um, structured and uh, we have the soil organic carbon component, but also the co-benefits, which include ecosystem health, animal welfare, and, and soil health. And um, if you scroll below that, there is a section that highlights a little bit more details about how the carbon plus uh, grasslands, uh, in this case, credit uh, applicable here, um, is structured. Uh, there isn't a, um, right now it's not visible, but there's another tab that will have all the documentation of the project, which includes the project plan and the monitoring reports and any issuance of credits. Below, um, you can see the land management actions um, and you can scroll through them, uh, really highlighting what the work on the ground has done. And there's a call to action below that. Uh, sorry, there's also a map um, that really gives you a sense of where this is and you can zoom in. And there's a call to action below that, um, the green button, uh, which Right now is sending more info, but shortly will be actual uh, purchase of the credits. Um, maybe we'll spend just uh, 30 seconds kind of looking at the other slide and the other page. Or not. The share screen's off also, Sarah, there you go. Sorry, it takes Great. my computer a second, folks. No worries. So uh, you can see here, uh, Stuart and Trish uh, on the left, uh, they're actually a uh, Wilmot Cattle Company. Uh, they're the land stewards that have been doing all this great work on the ground. Uh, part of the reason for the upgrade uh, is we've been uh, conversing with corporates and, and really trying to align with their priorities and it was important for them certainly to get a better understanding of who the land steward is so uh, we've decided to do a facelift if you will for the project and, and really have a more focus on the land steward here the other thing we've added on the right uh, is the sdgs which again corporate buyers particularly care about these are the um, sustainable development goals of the um, united nations um, and each project will uh, uniquely have its own SDGs that we map to. Um, I don't know if you want to show maybe a couple seconds from the video. Uh, it's actually a really well done video. Okay, we can't really get audio here, but um, I encourage you guys, it's, it's, that video is actually live also on the uh, existing project page. Uh, really well done production here. That's uh, Stuart talking in the background. Um, and that's about it. I mean, uh, if you scroll down, you can see we've also improved the layout of uh, how the credit uh, is structured. Um, between the soil organic carbon and the co-benefits. Um, 
those are the main changes in this, and we'll, we will continuously upgrade and uh, innovate on this page. I think uh, next is you, or is it my next slide, Sarah? Great, so I apologize that my computer is slow. <laughs> For the rest of you out there, um, I am not the most tech savvy creature on the world. So we wanted to talk to you in the context a little bit about how do we monitor soil changes um, so that you as ranchers can get a sense of how we actually quantify carbon stock changes on a property. And then in the case of your ranch, what might that mean for you? So in the case of Wilmot Ranch, we monitored soil organic carbon changes using remote sensing. And we use the European Space Agency satellites uh, called Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Uh, they are, they fly over the world every day and they have since 2016, 2017. And they take a picture of the earth about every 16 minutes. And the data for this satellite is free, open and available to the public. And so we partner with this tool because we believe that everything that we do should be methodologies that are open source, that other people can innovate on, that other people can come in and utilize our tools in an open uh, fashion. So in the case of Wilmot Farm, what we did is we took a very limited series of soil samples. Their ranch is about, I think you said about 2,000 hectares, Ron. Um, and so in the case of a ranch that is 2,000 hectares, we require a limited series of soil samples because what we're ultimately doing is taking about 20 soil samples for 2,000 hectare properties. And we are taking the results from those soil samples and calibrating them to the satellites. And so this map that's on the right-hand side is a very good visual of the outcome of that process. What we basically do is take these soil sample results from your traditional university laboratory and we utilize them to use machine learning to map out what the answers for soil organic carbon percentage would be across an entire property. In the case of the way that traditional project development is done in the carbon credit market right now, they require you to take you know, thousands of soil samples across many, many hectares in order to try to get a good sense of how much carbon stock change there might be. What we have found is that this correlation mechanism between a very limited number of samples and the satellite bands is that there's a 93% uh, accuracy rating for the virtual soil sample maps that we can produce and from which we can calculate carbon stock changes. So we're using the remote sensing monitoring tools to make the monitoring process significantly more cost-effective and efficient for individual ranchers or ranching organizations that want to do monitoring for change of state on a property. And we're using the remote sensing to quantify the ecological outcomes, um, particularly for soil health and ecosystem health that are appropriate for each eco region. There's a quick uh, question. Do either of you know the samples per acre? Um, no, it's 20 samples per 2000 hectares. So um, we mostly work in hectares, which is 2.47 acres per hectare. So I think you could probably do the math off of that. Yeah, it's, I would mention it's not linear though. So uh, there is economies of scale, certainly the larger the farm, the, the lesser proportionate amount of samples are needed, but uh, uh, we, the minimum will be around 20 samples, uh, even for a, a much smaller project. And I, I just want to flip. I'm sorry, real quick, I just wanted to flag, I put in the chat also some resources uh, for the Carbon Plus um, credits uh, that are located on Regen Network, as well as the uh, medium, some re medium resources, um, including our lead scientist, Giselle Blumen, Dr. S Giselle Blumen. So hopefully that will uh, help fill out some of the questions. 
Yeah, and we will send out um, a follow-up email to everyone who is here with all of the resources that are abundantly available on our website. So if anybody has any additional questions we don't address here today, we'll try to address them in the questions and then we're happy to email with folks as well after this. So Ron, do you want to tell us how it works, like how, it, how having a project happens? Yes. Um, all right. So the project registration uh, is fairly straightforward. We ask uh, land stewards initially to fill up a, a simple intake form. Uh, it shouldn't take you more than a few minutes just to get a better sense of uh, the land and uh, what you're working on and, and the fit to our uh, credit. Uh, assuming there's a fit, uh, the next uh, stage would be, sorry for the background noise, uh, street cleaning. Um, the next stage would be filling out a project plan. Uh, and uh, there's a fair set of questions there, but ultimately, I, if not in one sitting, probably you can complete it in two uh, and shouldn't take more than a couple of hours uh, maximum. Uh, once that is submitted, we review it. If everything is in order, uh, then we sign a contract and we sign and we, the project uh, begins the next step is, session, <clears throat> is essentially uh, conducting the monitoring uh, so the, creating the baseline uh, and there's a schedule uh, stipulated in both the program guide and the credit class around verifications uh, so there's uh, for instance in this credit class a verification done uh, at the beginning of the project the end of the project and then uh, at the middle of the project depending on the size of the issuance um, Generally, the credits are uh, certainly in, in the case of carbon plus brasslands or uh, what's called ex post, meaning they're issued after the verification is done of the actual verification that is of the actual carbon sequestration. Uh, and the ownership is tracked uh, initially on our uh, uh, registry software uh, that is uh, uh, for those uh, techies out there is centralized, but uh, in a few months when uh, we launch our blockchain, uh, then it will be tracked also on the decentralized blockchain side. Um, the monitoring and the verification, so during the project and the crediting term uh, varies between different credit classes. In this case, it, it will be 10 years um, and we require six monitoring rounds. Um, and those monitoring rounds, uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, are conducted using a minimal amount of soil samples collected on the ground, which are coupled with uh, remote sensing analysis. Uh, and the verification is needed, as mentioned, only if there's a very significant, uh, I might say almost abnormal uh, sequestration rate that we just wanna provide additional assurances to buyers. The data uh, generally, in this case, is connected from, uh, collected from uh, Sent Sentinel and the soil samples collected on the ground. Um, in the future, we will try to leverage whatever technology is available out there to really cut costs, including IoT sensors or uh, drones or using LiDAR and, you know, in sort of forest, more forestry related credits. But in the context of this credit, uh, we're, we're just using the soil samples, um, information provided uh, by you guys related to animal welfare, and the rest of this is from remote sensing uh, imagery. Um, all of this is posted on our uh, marketplace, which you've seen uh, the project page for. Uh, obviously, a marketplace is sort of a more vibrant uh, location that has uh, multiple projects. This is, we're just starting up, so it'll take a little bit of time to get there, but the idea is to create a portfolio of projects that buyers can then uh, finance uh, according to their uh, climate and sustainability goals. And the payments are all facilitated as, as uh, I don't think we actually uh, walked through that, but the payments are facilitated also on the platform. So uh, an account is created and you can see the account overview on the left um, image here. Uh, when you create the account, you provide your financial uh, details. We, we use a third party called Stripe to facilitate the payments. And so essentially when a buyer um, uh, buys credits, uh, we take our fees and then the, the rest of it goes directly to your uh, bank account, essentially, and uh, is immediate. Um, next slide. I think this is you. Yeah. So 
What we're doing on Regen Registry, utilizing the outcomes of soil samples coupled with remote sensing correlation, is that we are issuing credits. And we consider our credit framework to be the next generation of ecosystem credits. And ultimately, what we're doing with the concept of carbon plus is we're saying an ecosystem is a whole ecosystem. And we need to honor and acknowledge and quantify what's happening in each part of an ecosystem. Carbon credit buyers need carbon because they're dealing with their greenhouse gas accounting. However, we feel it's a very narrow lens to just look at carbon. We want to look at the entire ecological interactions of a unique property and be able to say, these are what we can monitor using modern tools. These are what we can quantify regarding ecological benefits, and we're gonna couple those with carbon. So the carbon plus credits are a design that puts carbon at the center because it's what carbon credit buyers need but puts all of the other ecological indicators around it. So it's a little bit like a flower, like carbon's at the middle and all of your other ecological outcomes are like leaves that wrap around that carbon. So we really believe in regenerating whole ecosystems, not just marginalizing one aspect of ecology and selling it. So our first carbon plus credit is focused on carbon sequestration in the soil. And then it, the ecological co-benefits that we showed you on the project page, we're looking at ecosystem health, where we're using the Australian uh, National Animal Welfare Guidelines. And then we utilize the soil sample results to create determinants of soil health indicators. So in our case, we issued our first vintage to Wilmot Farm in New South Wales that you saw on the project page. And in their case, they're a really like gold star, great example of what a rancher can do. They've increased the soil organic carbon percentage on their property to 4.5%, which is a relatively high soil organic carbon percentage for a rotational grazing project. And we are now issuing the largest vintage of carbon credits related to an agriculture project in Australia for Wilmot Farm in New South Wales. I'm trying to switch slides, but my computer is slow. I apologize. Oh, too far. So I wanted to give you a sense because I think this is really fun and interesting and an interesting way to think about property is that we're thinking about our carbon plus credits way beyond just ranching. Ranching was our first example of what could be done and how could you measure soil organic carbon. But we are looking at a much broader series of agriculture practices because we want to incentivize farmers and ranchers and land stewards adopting regenerative agriculture practices. Because our theory of change as a company is that ecology and agriculture are solutions for climate change. They can be carbon sinks, they can be places of ecological regeneration. And since we ourselves were land stewards, uh, a lot of us in our careers at some point, we believe in rewarding land stewards. So we've been looking at other agricultural practices on farms. We've been looking at agroforestry, cover cropping, no-till, crop rotation, silvopasture. We've been looking at conservation practices and conservation indicators, like how do you restore a wetland or a mangrove or grasslands, or how do you reforest a deforested area? We've been looking at ecosystem health. And we have the ability as a company to uniquely partner um, with corporations that have agricultural supply chains, tea companies, chocolate companies, you know, people who have these big footprints um, to help them determine what the ecological indicators for their supply chain are. And because we have this modular framework, um, our region registry invites other individuals to join us on this journey of saying, what should ecologically focused, agriculturally driven carbon credits look like? And we believe that we're not the only you know, organization that can design carbon credits based on agriculture and ecology. We want to invite a community of carbon credit designers to join us and to figure out how to measure and monitor and package together ecological outcomes into the marketplace that companies will be comfortable with. And I'm trying to switch lights. There we go, we're on. <laughs> uh, 
I think you skipped a slide. There we go. Um, right, so uh, Sarah shared, you know, our roadmap and uh, direction where we're trying to head in terms of creating uh, future credits. But uh, to take a step back, we're very much trying to convene he convene a community of uh, credit designers and methodology developers uh, that will create the next generation set of credits. Um, we have our ideas and we're excited about them, but we, we're sure there's uh, a lot more potential uh, and ideas out there. Uh, and, and a lot of what we're trying to address here is the need for context specific um, credits and methodologies. Uh, it's uh, not working this one size fits all uh, paradigm, which is pretty uh, prevalent in, in existing registries. Um, so if you choose to do so uh, as, a, as a project developer, uh, you know, you see a um, ecological benefit uh, in your project uh, and currently the, the carbon plus grasslands, for instance, is not a good fit. Uh, you can uh, put together a concept note and uh, propose a new uh, credit and or methodology. Um, and uh, there's different ways to do that. You know, we can uh, uh, actually be hired uh, as region network to do the writing of that methodology and credit, or you can hire an external consultant. There's uh, a few out there who have experiences in writing protocols for existing registries. Um, or you can develop it yourself. Um, the next stage would be to actually have a pilot project that uh, the methodology and the credit are tested with. Uh, and it's important to really, for us to really build it from the ground up. Uh, there's no shortage of protocols out there um, that have not issued a single credit to date. And we think a large reason is for that is that uh, they were not really developed uh, with a user-centric design and, and getting the appropriate feedback from the ground up. The next uh, phase after that would be to gather feedback both uh, from the general public and from subject matter experts in a peer review process. Then incorporating that feedback, making upgrades, and if everything is, um, if there's no uh, uh, issues or problems, uh, then publishing that methodology. And based on that methodology and or credit, uh, we can then issue credits um, to your project. So that is the general process. Uh, it's not uh, much different, uh, to be honest, from existing registries. So we try to keep the bar high here in terms of uh, the rigor and um, transparency and openness uh, to uh, feedback. This also gives you a good sense of the steps that we have taken for our carbon plus grasslands methodology. We are in the process of going towards the peer review stage for the method right now. Um, and you know, we designed it, tested it, and are doing a feedback process soon. And then we're ultimately have a version of it published and then we're issuing credits from it. So this is a very similar pattern that other folks could take if they wanted to create something new. And it also gives you a sense of what we did um, in developing our methodology. So this gives you uh, an overview of uh, the project lifecycle. Um, all of this information is, in, is on our website. Uh, specifically, the program guide is uh, the detailed um, rules and procedures, if you will. Uh, but there's also a summary of this in the FAQ and the uh, and yeah in the FAQ and then in the resources pages the resources section I think Dave shared it uh, has the program guide. Um, so first you start by registering the project. Uh, I mentioned that submitting a project plan, uh, signing the terms of service. Uh, we review it and uh, approve it, and then uh, sign a contract start a baseline measurement uh, of the, in this case, carbon stock and the co-benefits. Um, the land management uh, activity is, is implemented on the ground. Uh, so for instance, rotational grazing in the context of, uh, or, or uh, time controlled uh, rotational grazing in the context of uh, Wilmot, uh, the farm we shared. Uh, the change is monitored over time. Um, we conduct 
uh, or require in the carbon plus grasslands six monitoring rounds, so baseline and five more. Um, the verification is done at the beginning of the project and then at the end of the project and midway after big uh, issuance events, uh, essentially trying to provide here additional assurances to buyers. Um, hopefully there's a, there's a soil organic carbon accumulated and then we issue credit. So uh, based on the change between the monitoring round and the baseline, uh, we issue uh, credits to uh, your account, which are then um, available to sell uh, on our market. You can also sell it uh, through brokerage services. Um, and these steps are, are repeated you know, throughout the crediting term, which in this case is 10 years. Uh, and at the end of the crediting term, you're able to renew the project uh, for another 10 years, uh, essentially indefinitely, but every renewal is another 10 years. Next slide. Yeah, so before we transition to our discussion portion of this conversation, I wanted to add that um, our goal in today's presentation was to give kind of an, a high level overview of how our registry works and what the steps in doing a project are so that ranchers and ranching organizations at the Kavir conference could start to get their head around what it takes to do a carbon credit project. Um, we, so one, we're keeping this presentation very high level, but as we transition to the discussion, if there are specific questions people would like to know, we are happy to answer additional items that we did not include in the presentation. We want everyone who is here attending to guide the conversation for the remainder of the time. Um, so feel free to engage uh, with Dave to collecting questions on the chat. Also, I wanted to, uh, folks to get a sense of, you know, if they were to come to the table to do a carbon credit project with us, which I'm sure many ranchers are considering, these project life cycle steps are really the, the basic activities that exist along that pathway. But what we haven't discussed in this presentation so far is that we utilize um, Sentinel-1 and 2 satellites, as I mentioned but they started taking pictures of land that was high quality in 2017. So for properties that have historical soil samples and historical bulk density measurements across their property landscapes, there is the possibility that we could establish earlier baselines than 2020, either 2017, 18, or 19, or 2020 now, because those are time periods where the satellite data is available. So for projects that find that they may be interested in exploring issuing carbon credits with us, um, keep in mind that your historical data back to 2017 may allow you to start your project earlier than if you don't have soil samples for a property. So I think with that, we'll switch over to Dave, who's gonna lead us through some lively discussion questions that some of you may recognize from our webinar pre-survey. And we're going to get to the part where we talk about all this, which is going to be really fun. So take it away, Dave. If you could uh, slide over to the next slide, Ron, that'd be great. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch another quick poll. It's very, it's a yes or no, or it doesn't apply. Have you applied for or participated in the carbon credit market or payments for ecosystem services? Poll is launched. If you have participated, uh, please let us know because it's going to key into our next question. Uh, if you haven't, then we'll get into why. All right, things are moving pretty fast. Like it, well, well done team. We are at 75% voted. Let's just hope our election looks similar. All right, so I'm gonna, it looks like it's slowed down. I'm gonna go ahead and close. Oh, 85%, all right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So as uh, looks like most have not participated, and obviously some of it just may not apply or uh, hasn't made sense, but clearly there's deep interest. Um, so we'll get into that um, uh, here shortly. We're gonna, if you wanna put in the chat, if you have not par participated, what has prevented you from engaging so far? And I also wanna uh, kind of audible here, Sarah and Ron, we got a number of questions I, I feel like we should start digging through. Um, just, I think it'll help be some some clarifying, but in the meantime, please, if you do have uh, any 
if you've wanted to participate in a carbon credit or ecosystem service credit market and haven't, uh, let us know why. And it can be any number of reasons. We're curious just for more uh, insight. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start uh, ripping through some of these questions here. And we have another discussion item shortly. But I want to, I can see people are pent up and ready to get some, some of these questions answered. So I'm going to go ahead and start in the Q&A. Um, so this goes uh, to either Ron or Sarah. Uh, does your screening process include a minimum size project, either by area or credits? Question mark. Yeah, so I'll take this one. So project scale is a determinant, uh, determined by a couple of factors. One is how much carbon is being sequestered on a property. The more carbon that's being sequestered on a property, the higher number of credits can issued and the more likely that it is a financially positive situation for a farmer to do a carbon credit project. Another factor in scale is price. For a, um, for a credit price of $15 per carbon credit, and we consider one carbon credit to equal one carbon ton. Um, in that case, uh, the break even scale is around 600 to 650 hectares per property size. A good example I can give is $15 credit price, one and a half uh, percent carbon sequestration for, per year um over the 10 year time period and 2000 hectare in that case the net income that a farmer could earn is about 200 to 250 thousand dollars over the life of that project and we have for those who are interested in the economic outcomes of this we do have some project performas that show um, the inputs and outputs of the process that we can share after this um, that you're all welcome to take a look at and see, you know, you can play around with some of the numbers. And I, and I can add, uh, Sarah kind of jumped right into the financial aspects, which uh, you will not hear from any other registry. Uh, if you speak with uh, Vera, for instance, they just are not aware of the cost because that's not their focus. They're just managing the program. Um, and the cost can be quite substantial. Uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, there is a threshold, but it's quite low in terms of size of uh, project. Um, I need to follow up with our science lead, but I believe it's around 10 acres or something to that effect. Essentially, we're using remote sensing and the Sentinel-2 imagery that we're using, every pixel is uh, 30 square meters. Uh, so we need sufficient amount of those pixels to be able to uh, have a, uh, uh, a um, correlation, a sci scientific correlation with the solar organic carbon measurements on the ground. Um, so the, the size of the project can be quite small, but as Sarah mentioned, the realities are that you obviously want to embark on a project that you believe will have uh, net uh, financial return to you. Uh, and so we, we've done our best to create a performa that will inform that, uh, taking into account the monitoring and the verification and the overall costs of running a project. Uh, and this is uh, sort of our first uh, attempt, uh, you know, dipping our, our toes in the water here and, and hopefully reducing the cost significantly. Uh, in, in other uh, credits, we, we might continue to innovate and see how we can um, reduce the costs even further. Um, and then the last comment I would make, uh, we do support for those of you who have smaller projects uh, or smaller farms or ranches to create what's called an aggregate project. So you apply with multiple of your, uh, let's say, neighbors. Uh, and so long as it's in the same bioregion, we can register one aggregate project uh, and obviously uh, that creates economies of scale and, and uh, enables um, you guys to have more money in your pocket ultimately. Thank you, very well answered. Um, so on a uh, couple, I'm gonna tie these two uh, questions together. What happens if a farmer rancher changes management practices during the 10 year methodology definition period? Question, and then, somewhat related, uh, but maybe you could just tag on, what happens uh, with fire? Uh, something, how might carbon credits work in landscapes affected by fire, either, either historically 
uh, prevalent fire regimes or larger, more catastrophic fires exacerbated by fire suppression and climate change. So I think both of those kind of beg a question of what happens, uh, you know, in the middle of, of uh, you know, this 10 year period of things, things change. Uh, I can take that. Uh, so we re require that the uh, land management activities be approved uh, as stipulated in the credit class or in the program guide. Um, and our hope is, you know, that will continue throughout the crediting term, but, you know, realities can be different and we acknowledge that. Uh, we basically uh, monitor the outcome, I should say, and not the uh, practice in this case. And so uh, you are free to ch uh, change your practice uh, that, you know, hopefully will not have a negative uh, impact on the ground. Uh, we certainly will want to know if there's a change from uh, grazing to conventional uh, cropping and, and tillage, which most likely will reverse any carbon sequestration. So the contract certainly stipulates that you cannot do, take on activities that are uh, directly going to reverse any carbon sequestration. Uh, but with that said, any other activity uh, it's your prerogative and, and you're able to manage it and we're measuring the outcomes. So ultimately, uh, we care less about the day to day, how, you know, the, the cows are shifting between the paddocks, for instance. Um, now regarding the fires, uh, we'll have to, uh, to be honest, uh, see how that, uh, evolves. The, uh, property in Wilmot actually has not surprisingly gone through fires recently. Uh, it did not affect our ability to measure uh, using uh, Sentinel-2 imagery. Uh, we do try to conduct the monitoring in the same exact timing uh, in, the, in the seasons where uh, the uh, soil is more bare and we can get more reflections. Uh, if in that exact timing there you know, are fires, we might need to adjust the monitoring timing uh, and so we kind of will have to be a little bit more pragmatic. And, uh, if in one year, you know, there's fires, uh, then we skip that year and do it in the following year. Uh, ultimately we're measuring the change. So the, um, the, we, we certainly understand there's natural fluctuations in carbon and this could be whether there is fires or, uh, or without fires, uh, and the, the ability of nature to recover and be resilient is, is taken into account here. And, and over the crediting term, our hope is that, uh, that and any potential loss will be um, reversed uh, in subsequent years. Um, one of the future project or methodology upgrades uh, we're planning on doing is also doing what's called dynamic baseline, which will actually take into account any such reversals uh, based on fires and droughts, uh, uh, extreme weather patterns, essentially. So the land steward is not uh, penalized, essentially, for no fault of theirs. Uh, the initial methodology is using a static ba baseline. Um, so, uh, but that, that's sort of the, the first step where we're, where we're um, starting with, and, and hopefully we will upgrade that fairly soon. Ron, do you Great. want to briefly tell them a little bit about just like permanence and the buffer pool? Sure. So that, that's sort of what happens even in a non-extreme context. Right. So every allocation of uh, credits, every credit issuance, um, first of all, in the methodology itself, uh, there is a um, uh, quantification of the uncertainty. And based on the, that quantification, a deduction is made in the uh, estimation of the carbon stock. So we try to be really uh, conservative. Um, so just to go a little bit more into the details, the correlations between the soil organic carbon percentage in the soil samples and the uh, remote sensing, we hope that it's above 80%. But if it's below that, then we essentially take a discount uh, that we apply to the carbon stock. So that's one thing related to the uncertainty estimation, but ultimately we get a number, let's say 10,000 credits for a certain uh, monitoring round. Uh, we take 20% of that and we put it into a buffer pool. 
that buffer pool is intended exactly to accommodate any changes in uh, whether it's from fires, droughts, uh, management, uh, financial, all of the risks entailed with you know running a project over uh, you know the duration of the crediting term. And this is standard practice in all registries, and we uh, followed suit with that. The other thing that we did innovate here beyond the 20% uh, buffer pool is a, re a dedicated permanence reversal buffer, which is uh, 5%. So uh, all together, that's 5%. And uh, that is actually an optional uh, reversal buffer. You can also um, choose to put the, the land under covenant. Um, but the idea with a reversal buffer, so the, the credit, the crediting term is 10 years, but then there's a 25 year permanence uh, requirement uh, because buyers uh, need to get assurance that the carbon is actually retained in the land for uh, a significant duration of time. Uh, and, and we put it in 25 years uh, because uh, we thought that longer periods would not be viable for most land stewards. Um, so to make sure that the carbon has been retained in those 25 years, that is why we have the dedicated permanence reversal buffer, which is that additional 5%. At the end of the permanence period, which is uh, 25 years, we do a, another monitoring round. And based on the monitoring round, we reconcile the, any changes in the, in the carbon. Uh, and if there are any uh, deductions or, or reversals, then we, we take them off from the reversal buffer. Uh, with the buffer pool, the same happens at the end of the project. So 20% is allocated to um, the buffer pool, as I mentioned. At the end of the crediting term, we reconcile, uh, we do an uh, end of project measurement. If there has been, unfortunately, a uh, deduct, a um, reversal uh, of the carbon, uh, below the last recorded uh, carbon stock level, then we use that buffer pool to uh, account for that and we retire credits from the buffer pool. So that way you're not uh, uh, penalized and uh, the buyer can get assurance that what was actually issued is indeed uh, um, legitimate. So Ron there, Ron or Sarah, there was a, there was a couple of questions related to if you're operating on partially leased land, do you need to access agreements with a landowner? Um, and then similarly, does this have to be only on deeded land or can it include leased land? Or does that depend on the individual lessor? Just any quick uh, response to that? Yeah, maybe I'll take this one. Um, if you're leasing land and you do not own it, uh, this process would require uh, some type of written approval from the landowner. Leasing does not prohibit somebody from um, being paid for the benefits of their land management practices, but the landowner has to be aware of giving away those rights to the person running the project or provided the opportunity to decide if they want to partner on that project. Do you have anything you want to add, Ron? I would just add that to support uh, partnership opportunities, we're actually built into the registry the ability to define multiple accounts that are uh, eligible for any credit issuance and the breakdown of those, uh, uh, of the ownership of those credits. So for instance, if the landowner and you agree to have a 50-50 split, uh, we can define that, create accounts for both of you guys. And uh, for every credit issuance, we allocate accordingly. 50-50 uh, uh, the credits. Great. Well, thank you. Um, there's a few questions related to, uh, you know, one, have you done any projects in the in the states? And then on a related note, have you worked with Indigo Ag, Nori, Soil Value Exchange, Rice Baker Institute, or other carbon sequestration groups in the United States? How does your com uh, program compare with those groups? Maybe I'll start and then you can add if you want anything, Ron. Um, we have not yet done any projects in the United States. We actually have a long list of ranching uh, projects in the US that are interested in partnering with us. And so we're waiting for a couple of things to line up in order to start with US projects. Um, our first project is in New South Wales, Australia, and we anticipate doing more projects there as well as adding projects in the United States in the coming year. 
regarding the, <laughs> excuse me, the other platforms, um, we are, um, I would say, friends and collaborators with Nori, who was a part of the Techstars Nature Conservancy Accelerator that we were also a part of um, in fall of 2019 as a company. Um, we are doing some things differently than these other uh, programs that are out there. One is we're using our platform, the Regen Registry, as a way of having increased marketing for projects and their outcomes. Um, we are also unique in that we are focused our first methodology on grasslands and grazing, and that we have found a way to measure soil organic carbon via the use of uh, remote sensing satellites in a unique and efficient way. Do you have anything else you want to add to that, Ron? Great. So um, as far as uh, upfront costs, are there, uh, are there for ranchers, do they have upfront costs to run a project or get involved with this? Yeah, so the, the costs are primarily in the monitoring and verification to establish the baseline and monitor the property changes six times in a credit term. We anticipate that each monitoring round could be anywhere from $8,000 to $15,000. And that we have seen in the marketplace that the third party verifiers, which are not our company region network performing that role, that they're about $10,000 to $15,000 uh, per project uh, verification. So what we find in that, and this is where we will share the performa with folks after, because these things are very clearly laid out in a spreadsheet, which makes it a lot easier. Um, but what we find with the project term is that there are some upfront costs for monitoring for the first two years. And then on the third monitoring time period, we issue the first credits. And that typically more than covers the costs that have already been spent in the project. And in a lot of cases, starts to move you already into the net income territory for the project. But we can share a performa that shows you the exact mechanics of that after the presentation, and we're happy to answer questions about that by email. And I should mention also that the verification costs uh, we are anticipating will go down when uh, we get more verifiers on board. Uh, the costs that we currently have uh, estimated are based on professional verifiers that are uh, working in the existing carbon markets. Uh, we are looking to onboard uh, new verifiers into our system. Uh, so for instance, we're conversing with the Savory Institute uh, and potentially we'll use uh, folks from their organization to act in, as verifiers. Uh, and we, in general, in the program guide, define um, requirements for uh, anyone who wants to uh, act as a verifier, uh, fairly straightforward requirements. Um, so hopefully that will uh, reduce the cost, which uh, ultimately are probably, uh, it's 50-50 roughly, but um, could be even higher cost than the monitoring. So we, we definitely want to uh, see how we can continue and, and uh, streamline these costs. I would also add with streamlining costs that we're finishing up automating the grasslands methodology with remote sensing. So we do anticipate that our cost to be the monitor and use remote sensing will also be coming down. Uh, there's some uh, several questions related to the buyer's side of the market. Can you uh, either of you speak to um, who they are, uh, demand, and maybe even some uh, context um, about the voluntary market and how you know Regen Network aims to um, proliferate ecosystem service credits in a space like this? Yeah, so maybe I'll start with this one and Ron can add if he has more. Um, we have seen recently a very strong trend of lots of different types of companies, big Fortune 500, small technology companies, consumer good companies, standing up and saying, oh man, we gotta do something about climate change. And so we've seen a lot of really big carbon goals come out from folks like Microsoft and Amazon and Stripe and Shopify and these, these big name companies that they want to become carbon neutral or they want to be um, regenerative by offsetting more carbon than they're responsible for. 
So we have been in discussion with many companies like this over the last six months around what their needs are, what type of standards they require for carbon credits, their familiarity with agriculture and ecology, and we're finding that their interest in these types of credits is growing as they're becoming more aware. Regen Network sits in the voluntary carbon credit marketplace currently. So what that means is um, we're unlikely to be a good match for a really big oil company or someone who is under legislative pressure to offset carbon, like a cap and trade program. But where we're a really great fit is for companies that are just getting started in the carbon credits marketplace, companies that want a really great connection to farmers and land stewards. They want to know the story of what they're investing into. They actually care about ecology and food and agriculture and ranching. So it's that sweet spot where we tend to have a lot more traction with credit buyers. Do you want to add anything to that, Ron? Sure, I would mention from a buyer standpoint, uh, we anticipate uh, consumers as SMBs as well to be interested in uh, purchasing these types of credits. Uh, there's a growing concern certainly in the broader population about climate change. Um, and corporates have typically uh, more stringent requirements about um, certifications and such. And so uh, smaller businesses might end up uh, picking up the slack, if you will, in terms of their interest in, in these credits. Um, just another comment in terms of the, the broader market. Uh, the voluntary market is uh, a small percentage right now of uh, the overall carbon market sale, uh, um, carbon market size, which is uh, mostly the European Union, the EU ETS, and the cap and trade in California, uh, and, and uh, the uh, Northern American or in Canada, uh, there's another uh, regulated registries. Those together, are, uh, off the top of my head, I think are around $250 billion, whereas the uh, voluntary is, is just uh, less than a percent of that. Uh, so we're trying to innovate here to essentially inform, hopefully, the regulated market of what's possible out there. Uh, and we're working with uh, uh, consultants in this space that uh, also are consulting to those uh, regulated markets. So our, from a theory of change, our anticipation and that's, uh, or our hope is that uh, this will lead to changes on the regulated side uh, in terms of how uh, public funds are currently allocated to farmers, uh, the ability to use remote sensing to really uh, streamline uh, incentives uh, programs, whether it's in the carbon markets or uh, payments for ecosystem services. So that's sort of taking a, a step back at the broader sort of theory of change of our system, because we really are building here not only a program uh, that we've kind of been diving into the details right now, but also the software stack that enables, uh, whether it's the remote sensing or the issuance of credits or the marketing or the sales of those credits, to be uh, used uh, for uh, different ecological assets, uh, be it payments for ecosystem services or carbon credits. Thank you. A uh, question from um, Eva. How can we ensure that the carbon markets are equitable and accessible to historically underserved communities? Either of you have a thought there? I thought that was an interesting question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to address it. So we've been talking about this a lot recently um, in our company. Um, because part of our theory is that we want to make sure that every small farmer is included. We don't want to end up in a situation where, again, we're just rewarding only the very biggest or the very best of an agricultural industry. We believe that the carbon credit marketplace should be easy and accessible to everybody. But the question becomes, how do you do that? Um, and there's really, there's, there's two tactics that um, allow us to intervene in this way. One is the uh, point Ron brought up earlier about aggregate projects. So if you have a ton of uh, small producers or producers that need to pool their resources in order to do a carbon credits project because they're historically disadvantaged or they're just getting started, allowing folks to band together 
and say, we're the chapter of X, Y, and Z in this area. We're going to, you know, couple our projects together. We're going to share costs by creating that mechanism that opens up the opportunity for smaller and smaller farms to engage with us. We're also looking at um, this through the perspective of the credits. Do they really need to have a very high bar for a buyer? If they do, okay, fine. Is there another buyer that maybe doesn't need quite as high of a bar and then the expenses aren't quite as much to produce that credit? <coughs> Excuse me, or we could use another tool that is more affordable. In some cases, just using a modeling tool for very small properties is a more efficient use of the farmer's time and money and our time and money to produce something that can be purchased in the marketplace so those individuals can be rewarded. So it's really about understanding the limitations that everyone brings to the table and then designing pathways that allow us to overcome those limitations together so that every small farmer and disadvantaged farmers can be able to engage with the credit system. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, a couple questions related to price. How did you derive, and I think you mentioned this around the $15 per uh, carbon credit uh, ton, uh, will this price change with the carbon market pricing during the duration of the contract? And there was um, another, I'd just say related, uh, does the carbon credit, uh, current carbon market reflect the true value of the benefits of increased carbon? So two kind of maybe a pricing framework, uh, quick uh, response. Maybe I'll start and then I'll hand to you, Brown. Sure. Okay, um, so this is a multi-sided a multi -sided conversation. One is what's the true value of ecology? And there are some reports that show it being, you know, a thousand dollars a carbon ton um, that are done by the UN and other folks. But part of our reality is that carbon credit buyers have a certain perspective on price. And so we believe that ecology and ecological interactions should have a very, very, very high value because we have been agricultural producers ourselves and we understand innately the value of ecology. But we're educating a bunch of carbon credit buyers about what carbon in an agriculture and ecology framework looks like. And we're up against their um, existing understanding of what they think prices should be. So we often from companies hear you know, $8 a credit, $12 a credit, $15 a credit, $20 a credit, it really can vary as low as a few dollars a credit from big, big companies to a much higher price per credit if it's an individual offsetting their carbon or a small company that wants to invest in the impacts. We anticipate over time that there will be a more of a dynamic pricing model on our platform it's driven more by a supply and demand pricing framework. Um, but at this point, we look both at the ecological outcomes and the quality of the project and establish what we think a price range would be. And then we field that with our carbon credit buyers in the marketplace and see how we can get our farmers the most money possible. Is there anything you'd like to add, Ron? Yeah, um, we're currently uh, with the first project uh, essentially acting also as a broker and uh, actively trying to sell these credits uh, and uh, figuring out the right price point. Uh, those are optional brokerage services. Uh, ultimately, it's up to each land steward to uh, decide on the price that they want to uh, offer their credits for. Uh, and obviously that has to be informed by where the market is. Uh, so. It is a, a fluctuating price like any market. The $15 a, a ton is uh, certainly higher than uh, the average um, price per ton on the voluntary market. If you look at a forest trend report, I think it's around $3. Uh, but we believe based on our conversations that $15 is achievable for the uh, differentiated and, and what you might call boutique credits that we're offering uh, here. And so we're certainly trying to structure the co-benefits and the overall ecological um, impact um, and identify the right buyers who are willing to pay those premiums. Uh, and you know, hopefully that will, uh, will pan out. Uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, the, there's different public sector analysis about social costs of capital, of, of carbon and uh, they can be order of magnitude bigger. Um, 
unfortunately, as a society, I don't think the, the private market has internalized that yet, uh, but we're, we're hoping to get there. Uh, but yeah, in terms of sort of the flexibility of setting the price, it's, it's totally up to the, um, to the land steward ultimately. And functionality wise down the road, we will add uh, probably an auction, uh, auction based functionality. But that again is a few, a couple years down the road when we have uh, a more vibrant uh, market of, of uh, buyers and sellers. For both either of you, um, Jonathan said, I've helped landowners with uh, California healthy soils, but it has been unclear to me, a federal agency staff person, how to help landowners go from getting a baseline and generating a carbon farming plan to get uh, to, to get to selling credits. So is there any thoughts for Jonathan on how to like support landowners getting the baseline, generating the carbon farming plan and then getting to selling credits? Yeah, so I would say that finding a partner like us that does um, have methods to monitor and package the ecological outcomes of that project type is a really good way to enroll those farmers. Um, there's a lot of information uh, farmers are collecting in a carbon farming plan, you know, under the Healthy Soils Program. And really the information that we need to issue carbon credits is soil samples, bulk density, and a little bit of information about property boundaries and how the cattle move. Um, so there are opportunities out there for farmers to have the option of engaging with platforms like ours to do the monitoring. There are options to take a look at what information is gathered in the Healthy Soils Program already, what information that you know, the, the government agencies already have, and say, is this enough to do remote sensing monitoring and issue a credit just from what's already available? So I think for federal and state agencies, it's around um, understanding the opportunity to partner. In the state of California, we're partnered uh, currently with an organization called Fibershed. Um, via an NRCS conservation innovation grant to develop a methodology to monitor sheep grazing and the soil organic carbon changes from sheep grazing and vineyards. So we have a history of partnering um, with entities with the programs like this that already reach farmers to say, what can we do together? How can we make the life of a farmer as easy as possible and help them earn as much money from what they're doing as possible? We're very aligned with that goal um, as an organization. Do you have anything you want to add, Ron? No, I think Dave will share the contact information. So I encourage you to reach out directly and we can set up a call. On a related note, um, could you, uh, Ron or Sarah, kind of uh, give us a brief thumbnail sketch of who we are partnered with in this space already, um, you know, on the government side, private sector, NGO side, that might be interesting to hear uh, for, our, for our listeners? Yeah, so I'll give some broad strokes. So I just talked about our partnership with Fibershed, which is a nonprofit in Northern California. Um, with that project, we're uh, partnered with the uh, California Department of uh, NRCS. We are also partnered with an organization called Open Team, which is funded by the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research um, from the USDA. And there we are partnered with organizations like FarmOS and Pasture Map and Dagan um, and the Cool Farm Tool. And what we're looking at is ag tech interoperability. How do we serve the needs of the farmers by making all of our tools function as the ability you know, to talk to each other and to work together to create combined solutions? So we are a part of that large consortium over the next three or four years via the USDA. Um, we are partnered with Impact Ag for all things ranching in Australia. We're um, hoping to do more projects with them there. And we have various companies that we are starting to work with that have large agroforestry supply chains in the U.S. and uh, in South America. We are also, um, we have a very wide community ourselves as Regen Network of farmers and ranchers um, across the United States and the globe that we're looking to partner with when we're able to take on more projects. And we've historically done um, monitoring pilot projects in Ecuador with cacao. 
and also in Barbados for broader land restoration goals. So we have sort of a wider portfolio than just ranching projects that we have done and a really global network of partners we're getting ready to activate. And I'll just add on that two other uh, important organizations we're working with are, uh, and this was mentioned briefly uh, earlier, the Savory Institute. And so we're um, actively searching for uh, projects to onboard um, on um, with this uh, carbon plus grasslands and uh, we're planning on working together to actually create a credit around their EOV. Uh, another organization is the, and Sarah mentioned this earlier, we participated last year in um, an accelerator program with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we've actually uh, explored uh, working with, uh, with TNC in, in Australia around issuing uh, credits. Unfortunately, uh, mostly given their um, corporate policies, we could not really go forward uh, with, uh, with the carbon uh, credits, but uh, we look forward to continue working with them on other engagements, uh, for instance, payments for ecosystem services uh, in uh, South America. There's a few countries that are embarking on that um, uh, direction and, and we're hoping to support them. Great and uh, final question and just noting obviously there's more questions that we just didn't get to today uh, both from a previous webinar and this one we're going to compile these and get them answered uh, and create uh, e even a deeper FAQ so stand by for that. Uh, this is from Sarah. What other methodologies that cover the same or similar indicators be accepted or will producers have to go through your specific methodology in order to be accepted into the registry and receive credits? So this is a little bit complicated. <laughs> and it, it comes down to there's, there's two layers in the world that we work in. One is Regen Network is developing remote sensing methodologies to monitor the ecological indicators and agricultural activities we think can drive the most change in the marketplace. So we are ourselves methodology designers and credit class designers. However, there are other people with other methods, other uh, ways to monitor and other carbon credit classes that can come to our platform and also propose their method. So a good example here is the case of the Savory Institute who we're hoping to partner with for their EOV program. They may want to create their own EOV based credit for their program participants. And if that's the case, it would go through an accepting process and that would be something that could be issued. So the answer to this question, it really um, needs to be contextualized um, for Sarah as to whether she is a rancher or an organization that might design a methodology. Um, but there are options. Our option is currently the one available. As more options become available, farmers and ranchers will have more choices of how they can monitor ecological outcomes uh, and change of state. Wonderful. Well, I think that brings us about to a close. Uh, again, we've got a number of questions that were unanswered. So uh, pardon me for not being able to get to all through all of these today uh, and get them posed to our panelists. But we'll do our best to get these answered and circulated. Uh, we are going to return to you with the following a recorded video. Um, the pro forma, I think that Sarah B had just mentioned as well as um, this slide. Uh, the slideshow. And uh, just a reminder, if you go to uh, regen.network on the web, we have an incredibly w uh, wealth of resources uh, very specifically about um, the methodology and the pro uh, uh, and this program if you want to dig in at our resources page. Um, and at the end of the day, we want to hear from you. So please go to regen.network um, and there's a land stewards page where you can sign up uh, to get more information and to stay on our radar as we uh, roll out uh, more information about this carbon plus credit as, uh, as well as future credits. So uh, I want to say thank you to Ron. Uh, thanks for being here to Sarah. Appreciate all of your energy and information. A big shout out to um, the Kavira Coalition and their partners uh, for hosting us today. And again, I'm Dave Fortson with Regen Network. We look forward to finding you on the web or otherwise. Please do reach out and let's grow this thing together. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your time today.